Hello, everyone. Welcome to our first virtual program here hosted by Planet Word. We have uh, been doing some virtual programs with partners before. This is our first solo mission. So thank you so much for joining us. I'm Rebecca Roberts. I'm the curator of programming at Planet Word. And I hope a bunch of you had a chance to visit us uh, when we were open last month. We are a new museum of words and language in the historic Franklin School in downtown DC. That's it in the back ground of my Zoom. Uh, and we chose uh, last month to um, make the hard decision that for the safety of the community, we would temporarily close again through the rest of the year. But we'll be back and we look forward to welcoming you in the building as soon as it's safe to do so. Uh, but for those of you who aren't able to visit, uh, I'm so glad that we're able to present some virtual programming for you. We've got a big lineup coming up for the rest of December and into January. Uh, so head to planetwordmuseum.org, that uh, URL is in the chat, um, to see what programming we have coming up. Also, if you're not a member of Planet Word but would like to become one, uh, you can do that on our website as well. Membership is one of the avenues of support we really rely on to be able to keep admission free to the museum uh, and to be able to host programs like this one. So thank you to those of you who are members. Um, and if you're not a member, all the information about how to join is on our website. So. All of that business taken care of. Thank you again for being here. And let me introduce our guest. Uh, ben Zimmer is on the advisory board of Planet Word and has been a really enthusiastic supporter of the museum for a long time now. Uh, he's a linguist, lexicographer, and the language columnist for the Wall Street Journal. Uh, we have him here today in his capacity as the chair of the New Words Committee for the American Dialect Society. As part of that role, he helps choose the word of the year for the American Dialect Society. Ben Zimmer, thank you so much for being here. Well, thanks for having me. This is a real pleasure. Um, you know, as you said, I've been a big supporter of Planet Word since it was just in the planning stages. And um, I'm happy that there's all of this online programming and, and virtual events that can take the place of uh, in person uh, events at the at, at Word at Planet Word for the time being until the doors can open again. Yeah, I mean, it's got its advantages and disadvantages, right? I mean, I'm barefoot. I don't know if anyone else is. <laughs> there, there are nice things about the virtual programming. Um, so why don't you start by telling us a little bit about the American Dialect Society and what sort of its role is and why its word of the year might be different from, say, a dictionary's word of the year. Sure, well, you know, the American Dialect Society is a learned society that's been around since 1889. Um, but it's been doing the word of the year since 1990, so 30 years now. Um, so way back in 1990, this was actually before my time. I was not, not yet involved with the American Dialect Society at the time. Um, but um, the American Dialect Society decided that they should have some events to bring a little awareness of what they do as a society in terms of studying, uh, you know, uh, English and other languages of uh, North America. Um, and the, so they came up with the idea of, on the model of Times Person of the Year, having a word of the year. And so, you know, it was just done uh, kind of as an experiment. And 30 years later, here we are. It's, uh, it's, it's continued to grow. Um, and there have been lots of, uh, lots of other groups like dictionary publishers that have jumped on this as something to do. Uh, but the American Dialect Society is, you know, we like to think of it as the granddaddy of the word of the year selections. Um, <laughs> you and, were there first. Yes, we were there first. And uh, we still hope to think of this as the most prestigious of the choices. Um, and so it's, uh, yeah, it's been um, something I've been involved in for, you know, about a decade. Um, and as chair of the New Words Committee, I get to sort of oversee the process, although I'm not the one actually picking the word, I'm, I'm presenting nominees and having people vote on uh, their choices. And the process is a little different this year, I understand. Yeah, that's right. Okay, I hope everyone can see my screen now. Great, so um, the process, uh, as Rebecca was saying, is a little different this year. But uh, we've been doing this, as I said, since 1990. And uh, what's different this year, of course, is that it's virtual. Like so much else that happens this year, um, we're, we're making this a virtual event for the first time ever. 
the American Dialect Society would normally be meeting, actually, uh, usually in, in the beginning of January, uh, in conjunction with the Linguistic Society of America. Uh, but the ADS canceled their annual conference. And so that actually freed Word of the Year up to actually uh, ha happen in December and to be much more inclusive in terms of who might be able to join in the proceedings for the you know time that i've been doing it people often say to me oh i wish i could be there for when this happens well now everybody who's uh, you know ever wanted to see what happens can can see it and also actually actively participate in it because how this works is if you register to participate it's going to be a live stream much like the one that uh, we're having right now as a zoom webinar um, and so uh, there's a registration process. It's free, again. Um, but uh, when you register, you can actually submit up to five nominations for words that you would like to see in consideration. Um, you can get this information by going to americandialect.org. Um, and uh, we have that information right there. You can also um, send um, nominations to Wody, uh, W-O-T-Y for Word of the Year at americandialect.org. Um, if you don't want to do it through that registration process, you know, we're wel we, we welcome nominations from, uh, from everyone. And so far, we've had a lot of people sign up. Uh, a few hundred people have already signed up uh, to take part in this, uh, this event that we're going to be having uh, in a week's time on December 17th at 7 p.m. So um, just to give you a sense of what we look for in a word of the year, words are nominated that reflect important events, people, places, ideas, or preoccupations of people in the past year. They do not have to be absolutely brand new, but they should have risen to prominence or reached some kind of popularity over the course of the year. And for the sake of what we do, when we say word of the year, really we're having, we have a an expansive uh, view of what counts as a word. It could be a phrase, it could be a compound, it could be a, a prefix, an abbreviation, something that acts like a word, something that is a lexical item that you might find in a dictionary. So uh, we have an overall word of the year that we vote for, but we also, since the beginning, have had various other categories as well. So most useful, most likely to succeed, most creative, these are all um, categories where we will have votes in addition to the overall word of the year. Um, and there are also new-ish uh, new categories that we've been adding in recent years, like political word of the year, slang slash informal word of the year, digital word of the year. To give you a sense of some of the words that have been uh, chosen over the years, um, I'm going to just give you a whirlwind tour of the past decade of, uh, of words, just so you get a sense of what ends up being our word of the year. Back in 2010, the word of the year was app. And uh, that was, you know, certainly a, a choice that was uh, big at the time uh, with, the, uh, with the app store and everything like that. Um, but you can see then in the other categories, um, you know, very often there are very interesting things going on there as well. Most likely to succeed, trend as a verb, as in trending topics most useful, nom, that's the noise that you make when you're, you're eating and enjoying it. And you can see other nominees there. I'm just going to go through, go through some of these so you can see, see what happened. 2011 was the year of the Occupy movement, which you might recall. It started with Occupy Wall Street and then um, spread from there. Um, and you can see some of the other choices for 2011. In 2012, the word of the year was hashtag, with the rise of Twitter, and uh, other social media using hashtags. Um, that's what was recognized that year. You can see another tech word, most like app. Uh, 2013, this was an interesting choice, grammatically speaking, because it was because, but not because as it was traditionally used, but because, which could be followed by a noun or uh, other parts of speech. So you could say because reasons or because science um, and, we noticed that that was a, a popular thing in 2013. 2014, you saw that the word hashtag was uh, a, a choice a couple of years before this, but an actual hashtag, the hashtag Black Lives Matter was the choice in 2014. 
2015 was another interesting one from a grammatical perspective, and that's they used as a third person singular pronoun, not a plural pronoun, which is not a new phenomenon. In fact, you can find singular they going back centuries in English, uh, going back to Chaucer's time, Shakespeare, Jane Austen, lots of writers have used singular they in various ways. But in 2015, there was a growing recognition of this as not simply this odd, uh, ungrammatical phenomenon, but um, something that was actually useful in terms of having something that was not gender specific, especially when it came to people who did not identify on the gender binary. Um, and so that was recognized in 2015. 2016 was a, a dumpster fire. Many people felt that was a dumpster fire of a year. Um, and you can see some of the other nominees there. Uh, 2017, fake news uh, with, the, you can see the, uh, the first year of the Trump administration, and there was a lot of debate over uh, Trump's use of fake news and, uh, and how that had changed and, um, and how that should be recognized by the society. 2018, uh, tender age shelter, tender age facility, which was a bit of a euphemistic phrase that uh, popped up um, that year with the, uh, you know, with the uh, family separation policy at the border. 2019, just last year, uh, pronouns again, uh, since, you know, we have so many linguists and language scholars involved, they love their, their pronouns. And this was the use of the word pronouns, or my pronouns, as a way of identifying yourself. Um, and you see this all the time now in um, Twitter bios, even, you know, some People in a Zoom, for instance, may, may put their pronouns there. So you might see pronouns uh, she, her, or they, them, for instance, if we're talking about singular they. You can see that last year was also the year of OK Boomer uh, and Karen and cancel, as in cancel culture. We also picked a word of the decade. And, and once again, it was singular they, which was selected for the word of the decade from 2010 to 2019. So that brings us up to date to 2020. So let's talk about some words from 2020 and what might be in the running this year. And as Rebecca said, if you have your own nominees, you can feel free to share them in the chat um, as I talk about some possibilities here. Um, so what, what would be your choice for 2020 word of the year? You know, you saw in the past choices, sometimes it was a word from the world of technology, sometimes they were political. In a presidential election year, we typically have something political as our word of the year, but this is a year like no other, of course. And so we expect words relating to the pandemic to be at the top of the list for sure. And there are quite a lot of them. I mentioned other dictionary, uh, dictionary publishers have been naming their own word of the year. Um, Merriam-Webster, pick the word pandemic, it may seem like a bit of an obvious choice. And in fact, dictionary.com also picked pandemic. Now, Merriam-Webster and dictionary.com, when they're picking their words of the year, they're looking at lookup data. They're looking at um, how often words are, are looked up in their online dictionaries. So you could understand why the word pandemic would have had a big spike in 2020 in terms of what people were looking up to understand the pandemic a little more. Um, and so other dictionary publishers uh, in the UK also uh, pick words of the year. For instance, Collins Dictionary uh, picked lockdown. Cambridge picked quarantine. And Oxford Languages, which you know, uh, is responsible for the Oxford English Dictionary and other dictionaries from Oxford University Press, where I actually used to work when I was a lexicographer, a working lexicographer. Um, they announced that they couldn't pick just one word of the year. It was a very intriguing choice for them to say, well, we're not gonna pick a word of the year. Instead, we're going to shine a spotlight on the way that the pandemic has shaped the lexicon in unforeseen ways, because they felt it was too big of a story to sum up in just one single word. Um, and so they came out with a whole language report talking about you know, all of these language trends over the past year particularly in terms of how the pandemic has changed the way that we talk and the words that we use. Uh, 
So uh, the American Dialect Society, I don't think we'll make a choice like that. We will definitely pick an overall word of the year in addition to those other categories that I mentioned. Um, so it's obviously it's been a very interesting year for words. There's been a lot of creativity, um, certainly starting in March when everybody was kind of cooped up at home and uh, perhaps had nothing better to do than uh, start making up words. But you could also think of it as a way that people were coming to grips with this very serious situation. And sometimes the words are serious, but sometimes they're very lighthearted because you, know, you can see that people were very often looking for maybe a form of pleasure in the words that were, were popping up. Now, we heard plenty of these words early on. I mean, I'm sure you can remember when you first heard about COVID-19 and wondered what the heck that was and learned that that was the disease, you know, it stands for Coronavirus Disease 2019. That's the shorthand that the World Health Organization came up with um, at the beginning of the year. Um, and then uh, social distancing was something we all became quite familiar with early on. We heard a lot about flattening the curve. Um, unfortunately, that curve didn't get flattened in the way that many people had hoped. But there were all sorts of uh, new words being formed, very often taking parts of old words and creating something new out of them. So because quarantine was such a big word, especially early on, uh, people started adding new endings by taking the beginning of quarantine and smashing it together with a part of another word. So you get a quarantini, which is, of course, a drink, a martini that you would have while under quarantine. You might have a corn beard. And in fact, I'm sporting a corn beard myself, which I, you know, started growing um, this spring and just, you know, kept, kept on with that corn beard. So that's why my uh, picture that you saw earlier doesn't really match what I look like now. Um, your quarantine could be sort of your pod or your bubble that uh, the people that you are, are with when you're quarantining. And then all of these corona words from coronavirus, coronasomnia if you're suffering insomnia during the pandemic, corona coaster because it feels like we're on a roller coaster in the way that this year has unfolded, corona cut when people were just cutting their hair at home or you know having their loved ones cut their hair uh, not professionally, then uh, people were sharing pictures of their corona cuts, a coronacation which you know is the best you can hope for in terms of the vacation might be somewhere very close to home. Um, and then, you know, uh, names for generations, the generation that's coming of age right now. And also, you know, there was some talk about how there might be a, a baby boom nine months after the, the, uh, the pandemic started because everybody was at home. So there was talk of coronials so on the model of millennials, of course, or corona babies. Or then for the older kids, I have a, I have a young teenager who's been uh, starting high school remotely. So He's a quarantine with spelled T-E-E-N as opposed to the usual spelling. Uh, just to keep going with some of the things that we've seen nominated from, you know, already from the hundreds of people who have uh, sent us uh, nominations. You know, here we are on Zoom and the Zoom itself has created its own vocabulary. So you're probably familiar with Zoom bombing when uh, there are unwanted uh, visitors in the Zoom who uh, might uh, do things that uh, are, are really unwanted. Um, then we have, you know, the Zoom mom, you know, before it might have been the soccer mom. But again, you know, with kids at, kids at home using Zoom for school, you, you, it's, it's the Zoom mom now. Zoom fatigue, I think a lot of us can identify with Zoom fatigue. And even just the Z of Zoom can form a new word. So zumping is a blend of Zoom and dumping. If you get dumped, romantically speaking, over Zoom, that's zumping. So we have a word for that now. Um, some other words that we've seen, you know, doom scrolling, that, uh, that where you're just scrolling through your social media feeds and you're kind of obsessing over the bad news and you just can't seem to just put your phone down and you know, stop doing it, um, that's doom scrolling. But you know, by, uh, by the end of the year, people were, you know, feeling a little more hopeful about some things. It might have been uh, fleeting, but at least some people were talking about glee freshing as the positive version, sort of the, uh, the opposite of doom scrolling. 
But there have been so many different words that have come out of the whole pandemic. Um, there are all these nicknames for coronavirus itself. Um, you know, young people have been referring to it as Rona or Miss Rona, sort of personalizing it as, uh, you know, kind of a uh, rhetorical device of personification going on there. Um, you may remember the before times. That's sort of, you know, the time before, before March, basically. And uh, the before times makes it, sound like, makes it sound like we're living through some sort of science fiction story. Uh, in fact, the before times uh, originally was used on an episode of Star Trek. Blurs day is a great word where everything just kind of blurs together. We've lost sense of time. So what day is it? I don't know, it's blurs day. And COVIDiot, very useful term for someone who does not follow those COVID protocols and uh, you know, perhaps flagrantly uh, uh, is uh, just simply flouting those rules then you can refer to that person as a COVID, a very helpful blend. So I call all of these things Corona coinages. I started collecting them uh, back in March. And when I started seeing things like quarantini or coronial popping up um, on social media, I started using Corona coinages as a hashtag, um, just as a way to sort of keep track of the things that I was seeing. Some other people started picking up on that. There were other there were other hashtags people were using like Corona speak as well. Um, but it was interesting to see that my particular coinage there of Corona coinage actually caught on a little bit. And so when dictionary.com, for instance, came out with their word of the year and listed all of their runners up, there was that word Corona coinage to describe a lot of the words that we've seen here. So um, I wasn't really planning on coining a word, but it's a very meta experience to be able to claim the coinage of the word Corona coinage. Um, I wrote about a lot of these in a recent piece uh, just earlier this week on a website that I contribute to called Beyond Wordplay. If you go to beyondwordplay.com, you'll see it right up at the top. And uh, yeah, so those are, those are my ideas, but uh, I'm sure that uh, folks here have their own ideas, or maybe you've seen something that I've already mentioned that really appeals to you. I'd love to hear what people have to say. Well, thank you. Yes, again, if you've got your own nominee for word of the year, go ahead and put it in the Q&A box. Um, and the registration link for joining the webinar next week to participate in the ADS vote is in the chat box, as is a link to um, that blog at um, beyondwordplay.com uh, that Ben just referenced. Um, so let us know what you think should be um, the word of the year. and. You know, Ben, I want to, there are a couple of things that I see trending here. First of all, um, it seems like there's a bunch of new retronyms, right? Uh, retronyms, if I'm defining them correctly, are words you didn't have to use to put a qualifier in front of, like phone. Now we have to say whether it's rotary phone or a landline phone or a cell phone. Uh, phones all used to be rotary landline phones. Um, and suddenly, especially in-person things yes. are yes. retronyms, in-person school, in-person church. Um, yeah, that's is, a really interesting that's development. Going on? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a, a keen observation. Um, in fact, I think that was actually mentioned in um, Oxford Languages, their language report. At the end, they, they, they talked about how that is happening now. So uh, a word like in person before, um, you know, was used for whenever you needed to uh, distinguish between those things, which wasn't necessarily very often. But now with so many virtual events, you now have to actually specify if something is in-person, like, like a concert, for instance. There are so few actual in-person concerts that when they happen, it's notable. And so you need something to describe something that was once totally ordinary and typical. Um, but because again, this is no ordinary or typical year, uh, the language has changed accordingly. I also, looking through, um these different choices, and I must say, I, I think that Merriam-Webster and dictionary.com going for pandemic is just a lack of imagination, although I do understand they're looking at search terms and usage. Um, but, you know, if you look back through your list that you gave of the previous years, a lot of them are very American, right? They are specific to things, you know, Occupy, fake news, things that were going on here nationally. And the pandemic is pan, right? It's um, something that I think uh, 
is crossing some linguistic barriers. Is it a uniter linguistically? In some ways. I mean, again, it's a global phenomenon. So once the World Health Organization says, yes, this is called uh, coronavirus and the disease is called COVID-19, that is in every language. You know, you know that day, <laughs> it, was, it you know, might have been uh, localized through some, you know, some translated form. Um, I know that uh, in, for instance, romance languages that have uh, gender, they had to decide what gender the, uh, to use for word, new words like COVID. Um, so uh, well, what did yeah, they choose? Uh, no. I, I think that the, you know, in places like France where there was a language academy to decide these things, um, I think they went with whatever was the equivalent, like if the word for disease is feminine, then, then COVID, because it's derived uh -huh. from this longer thing that means coronavirus disease should follow the same gender. But even in English, we have world Englishes. English is global. So I, 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 you know, the things that I've been talking about, yes, do have an American slant to them. But uh, if you look at Australia, for instance, uh, Australia has a couple of dictionary publishers that have also named word, words of the year. And the type of thing that they look at is, is, is more Australian. They might start with um, typical standard words that everyone is using, but then Australians like to create clipped forms. And so instead of isolation, for instance, they'll say ISO. And so that's, that became just a popular kind of Australian, you know, shorthand for isolation. And people would say, how's your ISO going? Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's interesting to see that um, even with this you know, global phenomenon of, of a pandemic, there are all sorts of local variations. Um, I will say in our own little poll just now, COVIDiot is the clear winner. <laughs> uh, I, I won't take That's it personally one. that no one has chosen Corona. I, I was never expecting that to be a word of the year. I just am you know, happy to contribute to the conversation. Um, you know, you mentioned the French Academy. We obviously don't have the functional equivalent. English, American English is constantly changing. Anyone can coin a term. Um, and I think, you know, those of us who work in word museums, that's the big fun of it. That's the joy and power and wonder of the English language. Um, do you, as you know, chair of the New Words Committee and a lexicographer, do you sort of have a fondness for brand new coinages over the reemergence of an existing word? Well, they, they're both fascinating in their own ways, really. I mean, um, what we saw, like with all of these corona coinages, again, were very often blends or compounds where you take two words and you combine them in a new way. That's pretty much the easiest way to make a new word. If you just come, out, come w up with something that's not based on previous words, you can't count on people to understand what the word even means. But when we all first heard about doom scrolling, for instance, this year, which is just a compound, you know, doom plus scrolling, you, you, got the, you got the idea right away because it was, uh, you know, we we're familiar with the scrolling part of it and doom is the, you know, the, that feeling of impending dread. It sort of took two ideas, put them together with those two words and, you know, there you have, you have a new word for this feeling that a lot of people were, were experiencing. Um, and so the same thing with, uh, you know, Glee Freshing uh, was just, uh, you know, proposed by a writer named Heather Schwedel on, on Slate um, in November. And again, it's, it's clear enough what it means because you can see what the components are. Glee plus refreshing, you get Glee Freshing and uh, it works, you know, you can, you can understand it, especially if you're already familiar with doom scrolling, you can see how it's kind of modeled on that. So words are always kind of building on other words, um, generally speaking. I mean, it's rare that we get a word that is just sort of, you know, Lewis Carroll style nonsense uh, that, that <laughs> enters the language and, be, you know, people start using because, because it's associated with a particular meaning. And even Lewis Carroll made his own blends. I mean, he was famous for what he called portmanteau words. So for instance, right. word like uh, chortle, chortle, exactly. You know, one of his, one of his more famous ones. Uh, is a combination of chuckle and snort. Um, and so we're, we're constantly using the building blocks of old words to create new ones. Um, 
We've got a question saying, you've mentioned a lot of pandemic related words. How about the US election, both up in the, in the run up to the election and post election, what words are you seeing there? You mentioned glee freshing, which might, people might have been doing if they were looking for vote recounts uh, throughout the week after the election. What are some other uh, election related words you're seeing? Yeah, I mean, uh, we're, we're still seeing uh, new ones develop. Uh, I think, you know, ascertainment was sort of mentioned in uh, promoting this talk. And uh, sometimes, sometimes, you know, the political words that uh, develop might have some sort of uh, legalistic meaning uh, that was previously not really known by many people outside of lawyers or judges. So the idea of ascertainment, where, where uh, the idea that the winner of the November election needs to be ascertained in order to be recognized so that Joe Biden is really the president elect and can, and can start the transition is something that you know, we've learned about. And when we see it in news reports, we think, oh, ascertainment. I, I thought I knew what that meant, but this is a very specific meaning of that term. Um, and, you, you know, remember I when we all learned about hanging chads 20 years exactly. ago. Exactly. And in fact, yeah. chad was the word of the year for the American Dialect Society in uh, 2000, the year of the Florida recount. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, we, don't, we didn't have any hanging chads this year. Um, but uh, yeah, and, and we see that in other uh, election years. So 2004, for instance, was uh, actually uh, three words became word of the year. It was red state, blue state, and purple state because that was the first election year where people really in a serious way started using these color terms to refer to the political leadings of different states. Well, it's so interesting to think like, you know, that the virus obviously has overshadowed so much of what we talk about and how we're experiencing our lives. But in the absence of that, yeah, you know, we might be talking much more about coinage around the election or about the Black Lives Matter protests this summer. You yeah, know, absolutely. Is the word that has been brought up uh, in the OED list when they punted and yeah, and it's, it's interesting, too, how words uh, get politicized in ways that you can't really predict. So, for instance, in my Wall Street Journal column just last week, I wrote about the word Kraken, K-R-A-K-E-N, which uh, people may know as a, as a mythical sea creature, originally from Scandinavian folklore, which uh, became a popular uh, um, by sort of entering fantasy tales, including movies like Clash of the Titans, where uh, uh, in the remake in 2010, um, Release the Kraken became this uh, popular meme that people shared. And so this year, we saw Kraken emerge as the name for Seattle's new hockey team, um, right. the Seattle Kraken. And that, but that was back in uh, the summertime. Now we're seeing pretty peculiar uses of the word Kraken after uh, uh, Sidney Powell was, uh, was uh, presenting lawsuits in battleground states to try to overturn the uh, election results. And she said that she was going to release the Kraken. And so it went in a very different direction uh, starting, you know, in mid-November. Um, and, you know, those things can, can be used in political discussions for a while and then may fade away. So, you know, this time next year, we may forget about that use of Kraken and, but, you know, Seattle will still have its hockey team. So we'll be remembering it that way. Well, but that's an interesting thing, right? I mean, if you're trying to capture a word yeah. in a year, in a context, then maybe it's specific fleeting meaning is kind of what you're going for. You know, I mean, looking back on the list you shared yeah. of the previous 10 years, Occupy absolutely captures 2011. You know, we, right. we haven't necessarily used it in that same sense since then, but it was such a dominant feeling verb, you know, uh, protest movement then. Yeah. And, and are you kind of hoping for something that is almost faddish just so that it marks that year so well? Um, you know, for the overall word of the year, I don't think that people are necessarily thinking like, you know, will this simply mark this year? Some do, some don't. You know, we do have these categories like most likely to succeed for people to try to predict, will this really have staying power? And so you could see in some of those choices that the overall word of the year might be something that's really pinned to the events of that year. But if people are voting for most likely to succeed or most useful, they might think, well, 
what's really going to stick around in the language. Um, and sometimes those predictions are good, sometimes not so good. But I think that you know, when people look at what the American Dialect Society has uh, named as word of the year, sometimes they say, ah, you know, this one hasn't lasted as if that's the only thing that we're looking for. Um, but clearly that's Push not lips, the case. for instance, is not exactly. Yeah. So that's the, 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 <laughs> the classic case of that was 30 years ago in December, 1990, the first time that this, uh, that this happened, um, the word of the year as selected by, you know, the members of the American Dialect Society at the time was Bush lips defined as insincere political rhetoric. And that, for those of you who remember President George H.W. Bush, um, he had his famous campaign pledge, read my lips, no new taxes. So after that promise was broken, this term Bush lips was used and promptly forgotten about, except when people are talking about the word of the year and looking back and <laughs> what were they thinking? So we've had, we've had a few like that uh, where, where it's so fleeting that, you know, you have to kind of reconstruct why that word would have been used in the first place. Um, so another example like that was the verb uh, plutoed, to be plutoed, meaning to be demoted. Or, you know, if you remember the year that uh, Pluto right. deemed no longer a planet. Right. Um, that one didn't stick around. I'm not sure that was the greatest choice for that year. But you know, it was it was uh, it was the one you know. In the absence of other more obvious candidates, people kind of gravitated to. So it's hard to predict these things. If I were to predict this year, of course, you know, we've seen some of the top ones. I thought you know from the beginning, from March or so, that a term like social distancing, which I see has also come up in the chat, would be a front runner. Be kind of you know that as a term that really kind of encapsulates what everybody's gone through this year. Yeah, I mean, it's not only something we have to think about constantly, so it's top of mind. It's also a phrase none of us used before March 2020, right? right yeah, yeah. And in fact, I mean, that, that term social distancing uh, goes back to the mid 20th century. Uh, you know, I, the, the Oxford English Dictionary, for instance, you know, created an entry for that and a lot of other terms and, uh, that were, you know, coming up this year. Uh, the OED usually waits, uh, you know, waits to see how things develop over a long period of time. In this case, they did a kind of an emergency update. And some of those words, it turns out, words and phrases, um, are, you know, are older than you might think. And so you can find social distancing talked about in sort of social science literature going back to the mid 20th century. Even coronavirus actually goes back to, I think, the late 1960s is when that, when that term was coined because it refers to this larger class of coronaviruses, um, you know, including, for instance, SARS was a kind of coronavirus and even, you know, variations of the common cold. Um, and that's why this coronavirus is, is, has to be specified, uh, you know, more specifically along with uh, the disease that it causes, COVID-19. But of course, people just use coronavirus uh, in this broader way, but, you know, obviously referring to the only one that, that uh, people are, uh, care about right now. And then of course, COVID-19 just gets shortened to COVID. Um, and again, you know, this was a word that it, in the case of COVID that nobody, nobody you know, had heard of uh, nine months or so ago. And now it's you know, all too- Now far. we say it every day. Exactly. Yeah. Um, we have a question in the Q&A. Uh, we talked a little bit about words around the election. This question is, what words are rising to the top related to racial injustice? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I'd have to look over the nominees, but I know that there, there have definitely been ones that have been uh, coming in um, along those lines. And it's Systemic interesting. Systemic racism came up a lot What's this that? summer systemic racism yes absolutely so um and in fact you know yeah this was the year also that for instance merriam webster uh, revised its definition of racism to more adequately address you know what we now call systemic racism um, and uh, tying it to other sort of key terms like white supremacy or white supremacism um, and so those again not not new words necessarily but um but uh, 
in the case of, for instance, systemic racism, um, that was one that generated a lot of discussion in terms of what does it mean exactly? Um, you know, we have whole books written on the topic. Um, and so uh, a very hot button issue, obviously. A lot of times though, much as uh, you know, we recognize the hashtag Black Lives Matter back in uh, uh, 2015, no, 2014, um, that, uh, you know, sometimes it's a, it's a phrase that uh, may, you know, get treated often in hashtag form so that uh, it becomes a kind of a rallying cry or slogan. Um, and so, you know, you know, this year, unfortunately, with the George Floyd protests, we saw a return to the I can't breathe mm -hmm. uh, hashtag and slogan, which you know had you know, originated back with Eric Garner um, in, you know, I think that was around 20, 2014. Uh, and then um, you know, we, you know, unfortunately saw the return of that. And so the, you know, we can see how uh, language like that can become a rallying cry and become Become a kind of a vehicle for advocacy and act activism. Yeah, someone has suggested defund as another, right? Yeah, uh, contact exactly. defund the police. Certainly. Very contentious term. Yeah. Yeah. Which leads me to be a, to ask about sort of the life cycle of these words and their definitions and who gets to define them, right? I mean, I think that um, as somebody who observes words in the wild and watches them gain and lose popularity what is sort of the trajectory of a word entering the vernacular, getting defined, getting co-opted by different sides, becoming um, derided or political or whatever, you know, keeps a word from uh, being sort of universally accepted? How does that go? Well, there's no single story. I mean, every word has its own story, which is what kind of keeps me in business because <laughs> <laughs> I do, I just tell those stories. And, um, you know, the, the, the life cycle is different in every case, which kind of makes it fascinating. You can see some overall trends in terms of the way that, for instance, um, certain new words and phrases kind of bubble up from a particular subculture or a particular variety of language. Um, certainly we see a lot of, uh, you know, uh, slang and colloquial terms coming out of, for instance, African-American English. Um, and this is often a discussion that happens at the word of the year because uh, sometimes you know words get nominated that uh, appear new for certain people uh, that are not necessarily all that new. Um, if you are you saying the, that the people attending the American Dialect Society meeting are not always at the forefront of trends in teenage slang? Well, <laughs> <laughs> we are all you know just you know paying attention to our own world, and unless you're sort of seriously digging into things, I mean, just as an example. Um, last year, I mentioned, um, uh, yeah, was it last year? Yeah, I think so. One of the runner up um, was Yeet, which right. is a, a popular, and I think it won the slang category. Um, and uh, that is used as an interjection and also a verb, very often having to do with throwing something strenuously, but also other types of motion. Um, or just an expression of excitement. And at the time that it was nominated, it was, a, you know, again, a new term for many people who might have been hearing it from their kids. Uh, it had become popular in gaming, you know, for kids playing Fortnite and that sort of thing. You know, but if you, if you just dig a little bit into it, you can see that, um, you know, the history of it start, started off several years before that with uh, some popular videos that were, you know, shared online on, um, uh, with, uh, with uh, young black people who were doing different sort of dance moves and, and, um, and Yeet had sort of grown, grown out of that. So, um, you know, when a word sort of goes mainstream or becomes more prominent, um, you know, sometimes there's a hidden story that might not be so hidden to other people who have more familiarity. But the nice thing about the word of the year is that we get to hear from a whole you know panoply of different voices people from different backgrounds so very often you know people will you know have a very animated discussion uh, about you know whether something should be recognized or not 
um, in the overall word of the year or one of the categories. Another example of that would be 2016 when dumpster fire went out. <laughs> there was uh, a lot of support for the word woke. And uh, that was the first time a lot of us had sort of heard about that word uh, woke um, as, its, as its use in terms of being enlightened on social issues and all the forms that that took like wokeness. Um, but again, that was uh, a term that you could trace in African-American usage back to the 1960s. And so there was very interesting kind of back and forth that year about, well, should, should we recognize woke as the word of the year? And uh, ultimately it ended up losing out to dumpster fire, which uh, people thought was a, a better choice for that particular year. It feels almost quaint that we thought 2016 was a dumpster fire. <laughs> I, know, I know, if that was a dumpster fire, what are we living for now? Um, I noticed when I registered for the webinar, which I did, um, and you're given a chance to nominate words. Uh, and by the way, again, if you all uh, here on this webinar would like to register for that one, the URL is in the chat. Um, it asks you if you would be willing to go to bat for your word. Yeah. What's that about? Well, I mean, this is all part of the discussion. Um, preceding the vote for each category, we, you know, we want to hear from what people think about the nominees. And when this happens in person before this year, we're all gathered in a ballroom somewhere uh, with lots of chairs set up. People, you know, raise their hands and say, I'd like to talk about, you know, whatever, dumpster fire, or whatever it might be, the, 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 the word or phrase under discussion. Sometimes they, they rise in support or sometimes they, they, you know, they're opposed to something being chosen. We were trying to replicate that in a broader way this year, um, you know, since more people can join in the discussion. So we want to know who, you know, who would actually be willing to uh, speak on behalf of a particular nominated word um, so that we can have that kind of uh, discussion it, we won't be able to hear from everyone, of course, because this is turning into a very large group. Um, <laughs> but we want to hear from as many people as we can in the time that we have without it sort of going, going out of control in terms of, in terms of uh, uh, people voicing their opinions. Um, but again, I mean, it's all part of the debate again. And, and people very often, you know, make their choices on what they vote for based on you know, passionate arguments for and against from, from uh, people who may speak from a position of authority or, you know, uh, have some familiarity and they can actually talk about how this word has been used and how it's important. Um, and so uh, it can be enlightening to hear that kind of discussion and it can really inform what people end up voting for. And remind me again what the categories are. Uh, well, uh, we've got, uh, uh, the overall word of the year, we have most useful, most likely to succeed, most creative is a fun category. Um, we have uh, digital word of the year, slang or informal word of the year, uh, political word of the year. Um, the, the, the categories have been a bit in flux over the past, the past uh, few years because we, um, we, we have been sort of rethinking some of the categories that were set up way back in 1990. So we used to have not just most likely to succeed, but also least likely to succeed. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, we decided that we shouldn't be in the business of deciding that this word is just going to fail. You know, why, why are we even trying to make that judgment at all? Um, and uh, so, you know, there are certain categories that we've gotten rid of. Um, we, uh, we've also had a category of euphemism of the year, sort of the, the best mm -hmm. euphemism. Um, but uh, generally we want to see what, um, what nominations come in, what people want to nominate. And sometimes we create kind of ad hoc categories based on, you know, the year. And so, you know, there may be, there may be sort of one or two special categories this year. We're still going to work that out before the main event um, next week in terms of what categories we want to be uh, presenting. Um, we've also, you know, we have a digital word of the year. Um, in past years, we've also had a hashtag of the year and an emoji of the year. Uh, we've considered emojis as well, even though, you know, not quite words, but 
often used much like words and have very interesting um, aspects to linguists, even if you know their 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 wordhood might be uh, uh, up for debate. Uh, currently, we're just putting hashtags and emoji together in that sort of digital word of the year. So, for instance, actually, uh, the digital word of the year last year involved an emoji. It was sort of a combination. It was impeach or impeachment written using the peach emoji. Um, oh. And so, you know, that was uh, something that it's people- a little risky with that peach emoji. There are some other yes, kinds. Yes, exactly. Well, yes, the, 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 you have to be careful with the, with the meanings like that. But actually, the, the singer Lizzo actually exploited that uh, double entendre. Uh, by talking about impeachment, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, also with the peach as the anatomical meaning as well. So, you know, emoji is a kind of a new uh, toy or, you know, a new tool you could think of as well in the repertoire that people have now for expressing themselves. And so, you know, that's something that, that you know, people who study language are very interested in just watching develop, you know, in addition to our old fashioned words. Uh, this actually gives me a chance to plug another uh, Planet Word Advisory Board member, Gretchen McCulloch, uh, who wrote a book called Because Internet. We talked about because something um, as a trend. And um, she her research is on how the internet has changed language. And she is going to be doing an event for us in February. So stay tuned for that if that is an area of linguistics you want to dive further into. Um, so how is digital word of the year? That's just something that seems to be coming up in social media more than in spoken English? Um, yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, hashtags and emoji are good examples of that. I mean, very often there are things that come up. It may be, you know, typically social media these days that kind of live online, right? Um, uh, sometimes, of course, they, they carry over um, uh, into, into everyday speech, but sometimes they don't, you know. I mean, you don't typically hear people using hashtags when they're talking well, so when people at least not unironically about, yeah <laughs> which they tend to be ironic about it um so uh so yeah so it, it's it, you know as gretchen mcculloch talks about in her book um there are sort of brand new modes of communication that um, allow people to express themselves in ways that don't necessarily have to map onto traditional uh written and spoken english um, they live in their own world very often. Um, and so, you know, that, that's typically what we're looking at with digital word of the year um, for that kind of language development. Do you find that sometimes the conversation gets dominated by the last couple of months? I feel like a lot of blank of the year, um, you know, if something came to prominence in October and November, it, it gets a disproportionate amount of attention. It does happen. I mean, again, it's the, the recency effect or whatever you want to call it. I mean, we're, we're, again, we're sort of victim to our attention being, you know, uh, mostly paid towards things that happened most recently. And uh, yeah, you can definitely look at, at examples in, in past years where that seems to be the case. Um, so, you know, 2008, uh, the, it was bailout because at the end of 2008, that's what everyone was talking about, the bailouts uh, during the recession. Um, and so, it, you know, it seemed like an obvious choice for that. So, yeah, it does happen that things at the beginning of the year kind of get forgotten about. You know, one example, which from 2012, people might remember YOLO as the acronym for You Only Live Once. That got very popular at the beginning of 2012, but by the end of the year, most people were sick of e even hearing about it. And uh, it seemed to have lost whatever luster it had at the beginning of the year. Um, and so, you know, that ended up you know, not doing so well uh, that particular year. So yeah, it, it, it's interesting. Sometimes, yeah, the words have a much better chance if they hit just at the right time uh, towards the end of the year. But this year, of course, um, we feel like we're in suspended animation. So it's really, you know, March through December, the whole kind of pandemic. Right. Era. Time has no meaning. <laughs> exactly. Blur's day. <laughs> Blur's day. Um, yeah, it could be anything from that period, but probably nothing from January or February, the before times, because who can even remember what we were doing or saying back then? 
Well, Ben Zimmer, it has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, again, the uh, link to participate in the webinar to help choose the American Dialect Society's Word of the Year is in the chat. Uh, if you are curious about more Planet Word programming, uh, that link is in the chat too, but it's planetwordmuseum.org. Uh, and we look forward to seeing what they choose. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks, it was a pleasure. And thank you all for participating in uh, our first hosted webinar here and uh, bearing with us figuring out the technology. And we look forward to seeing you at another Planet Word program soon. Thanks so much.